Hi, and welcome to this video. My name is Hugo Ferreira, and I will be introducing a project I've been working on for a while now, that I call the Foundry Distributed Processing Platform. There will be a lot of talk at the beginning part of the video, but later we'll see the thing running and actually chewing through some data, so at least that part should be fun. Now, disclaimer, expect a lot of acronyms and jargon, and excuse my inexisting video editing skills. I'm not very good at this. So let's jump in. So, I'm doing this project with two specific objectives. First, to allow me to learn and become familiar with NVIDIA's CUDA language, how to implement and work with OpenCL code, and to learn neural net math, theory, and applications, especially convolutional neural networks. Secondly, to have the ability to code what I would call computation-heavy algorithms from the comfort of a browser window in any low-power laptop. With this in mind, we will need a system that will allow us to maintain and execute code and store source data and resulting data. So, A. Write and maintain the code and algorithms to achieve a solution. B. Have a storage system for the source data. C have a storage system for the resulting data computed by the code, and finally D, be able to share code, files, and projects with third parties easily. So, with these goals in mind, we need much more than just a single application. We need a set of systems or an ecosystem. The Foundry ecosystem is composed of three separate but interconnected systems. These systems are designed when given a problem, to code a solution, and as we will see, each system serves a role. We start with Codex, a website whose role is to store and maintain source and output data in binary or text form, manage source code and any text files, and keep a history of changes. This is akin to versioning, which programmers will, will know from using SVN or Git. And finally, become a place where it is easy to share code and therefore solutions to problems. I truly believe we spend too much time reinventing the wheel. And to be clear, there is nothing wrong with that if your objective is to learn and become proficient with a specific library or language. But even learning suffers when data is scattered throughout the internet in no organized way. Let's move forward. Next, we have COGS. COGS is a simple, on the outside, but complex on the inside application that for now runs on Windows 10 machines. You designed your scripts in Codex and it's this COGS that runs that code and produces the resulting solution. You install COGS on the most powerful machine you can find, which nowadays can be almost any gaming machine with a decent GPU. Finally, we have Foundry. Foundry is where you register your machines running COGS, where you create jobs, where you group nodes into workgroups and jobs into projects, etc. Let's have a deeper look at COGS, the Windows 10 application. Each machine running COGS is called a node. You can install COGS on as many machines as you wish. It's in the roadmap to eventually create versions of COGS that run on other operating systems. So, COGS is what actually runs your scripts, your code, to chew large portions of data. To that end, it uses Lua, OpenCL and CUDA. When a job starts, it downloads source data from Codex, runs the computation scripts on that data and produces an output result, which it can upload back to Codex. It also reports job logs back to Foundry so that you, the coder, can track what went right and what went wrong. Its primary function is to expose compute-capable devices on the machine it is running on, be it CPUs or GPUs, so that a job can be computed. Lua functions run in a sandbox, so that a job can't access sensitive data on your machine. It can only access what you allow it to access. Security is further ensured with easily resettable tokens that you must register and then manage from Foundry. Let's see what we've been talking about. Here we can see COGS running but dormant on the system tray. 
It has a red dot, meaning it is currently unavailable. And this is what it looks like, a very simple application, on the outside at least. It's designed to run at startup and keep itself dormant in the system tray area until it receives a run job command from Foundry, which we will see happening later. COGS scans your machine for whatever devices it can use to perform compute jobs. Here you can see some system details. This machine has a 20 core GPU around 32 GB of RAM, of which 19 seems available for compute jobs. If you have an NVIDIA GPU card, that might mean that CUDA is usable. CUDA scripts are very powerful. They run on the GPU and they can greatly accelerate data-hungry algorithms. If you have an NVIDIA card, it is possible that CUDA is also present, which is an NVIDIA library used to accelerate neural network training. Apart from NVIDIA GPUs, you can also install OpenCL drivers that enable the running of OpenCL scripts, which are similar in nature to CUDA scripts. These two are designed for massively parallel programming, be it on the CPU, be it on the GPU. This is the best approach for AMD-centric machines. As you can see here, this machine has two OpenCL-capable devices, an NVIDIA GPU and an Intel CPU, with these details. Here you can see the network details, the host name and internal IP address. Regarding plugins, COX exposes an internal interface, so it will be possible for you to develop plugins for it. You can then query if a specific plugin is installed or not. For now, there are no plugins active. All in all, COGS is a very slim app. When dormant, waiting for jobs to run, it currently occupies less than 10 megabytes of RAM. This can quickly explode, of course, when working on a job. It can use up your entire RAM and keep both your CPU and GPU busy. It all depends on what tasks you give it to work on. Let's see the state options. Currently, COGS has its internal status set to unavailable. This means that this node won't run any jobs. Automatic means that COGS auto-detects when the user is away from the PC for a specified amount of time and can start a job if that is the case. I haven't worked out the concept of pausable jobs so that if you go out to lunch, it auto-starts as you're away and then when you get back to your machine, it should pause the job. This will require specific API calls. Scheduled means that you can define, in Foundry, a timetable for when this node can request and run jobs. You might prefer it to work only from 2am to 8am, for example. Let's leave it as available for now. On the About menu, we can fetch the unique ID of this COGS machine, generated at install time, and the access token, which we can reset. Without this token, you cannot order this machine to run any job. This ensures a level of security. Should you feel the machine's token has been compromised, you can easily regenerate it and later change it in Foundry. When I close it to the system tray, you'll notice that it now displays a small green dot, because we left its status as available. Ok. Next, let's have a closer look at the Codex site. As we already discussed, Codex is where we will store our data, where we will code our scripts, and where we will be able to find resulting data after Cox computes it. It has a Node.js backend that continuously operates on the site data and interfaces via WebSockets with any nodes you authorize to access it. It's centralized, it's easy to use, and it's shareable. So, after logging into the site, we should see something like this. I already created two containers for the purposes of this video. One holds COGS binary executables for download, the other a demo script we'll be later executing. I can right click on the work area and create folders or containers, as many as I want, even with the same names.
Name collision isn't a restriction while in codecs, but it might be when downloading files, so beware. These are folders. What about files? Well, I can drag and drop any file I want from my desktop onto codecs. The system auto-generates a thumbnail preview when possible. I can double-click them and see them full screen. You can easily upload binary data of any kind and almost unlimited size. So we've created folders or containers and uploaded binary files. Let's now look at the concept of blobs or version text files. They are the root of our code. I'm going to create a blob here called hello txt Now I'm going to enter edit mode and enter some random text and save a second edit and another save and finally, a third edit and another save. I can exit edit mode and I can re-edit the hello file. So let me show you how I can see older versions of the same file. All I have to do is use these buttons to navigate between edits. I can go to the most recent edit, to the first edit, or anyone in between. This means nothing is ever lost. You can write code without the fear of overwriting something important. All you have to do is go back in time. If structured well, this can be used in almost a slideshow sort of way, where we can see the evolution of a piece of code, a class, or function, gain form, be revised, restructured, etc. You'll notice that every single thing we've been creating and adding to our Codex workspace has the unique hash ID present in this field. This is extremely useful because that means it singularly identifies each and every resource on Codex. It is a randomly generated 16 character unique hash string. If you want to download a specific file, you don't mention it by folder path and name but instead by its 16 character unique hash ID. Finally, the last thing that connects Codex with Foundry and COGS are access tokens. Access tokens allow third-party code to access your Codex data. I've gone ahead and already created an access token for the entire year of 2021. It's not read-only, meaning that with this token, Cox can upload files back to Codex, and it is also not container-specific, meaning Codex can read and write from any container we want to target in a job. This will become clear later. Finally, all that is left is for me to show you Foundry. It is the website we'll be using to manage jobs, and much like Codex, it has a Node.js backend to automate several functions and it's an interface API for third-party apps. So, jobs requires data sourced from Codex, so you have to have a valid Codex token, which we already saw how to generate. Next, jobs requires one or multiple registered nodes to perform the actual computation. Nodes are registered by copy-pasting unique ID and access token from COGS after installation. Foundry is also where you can review job logs. A job can end in success or failure, and even before it ends, you can request status updates on long-running jobs. You'll also be able to define triggers for start and end of job events. Here is Foundry, very similar to Codex, I know. On this page, we can manage our nodes. Currently, on this account, I only have one, which I've called Main. It holds an NVIDIA 1060 6GB GPU. This is its unique ID. And this is the access token, both copy-pasted from COGS. By registering this in Foundry, COGS can now query the site for active jobs that it can run. 
I leave it as active, but not public. Public nodes can be shared with other developers. As we already saw in COGS, you can set it to accept jobs in specific intervals, and this means that you, hypothetically, could donate your CPU and GPU power to other developers. Ok, let's look at the jobs management. This is where we create new jobs. Jobs can have a label and description. A job requires from Codex a specific Lua control file, which we identify here by its unique hash ID. For nodes to have access to Codex and download data, we need a valid token, so that goes here, we copy paste it from our Codex account. When a job runs, it can have parameters, we insert those here. Finally, all that is left is to associate an active node with this job. Here, we see that the job is dormant after creation. We can change its state to ready to run. This is also where we can set triggered events for job start and end. We can receive an email when the job ends or a pushover notification. I'm not going to talk here about pushover except to say that it is a small app for iOS and Android that allows us to send messages to specific devices using a simple REST API. Check the video details for more info. So, if you configure pushover correctly, you can receive a notification on your phone when the job starts and ends. We'll leave this blank for now. Finally, the logs tab is where we check run logs. This job has never run, so nothing to see here for now at least. We'll be back later. Ok. That was a lot of theory, let's actually create something. We'll be working on a simple script. Grab an image, convert its red, green, blue values to grayscale and upload it back to Codex. And here we are back in Codex. I already created for the purposes of this video a script container with this simple organization. The download folder will contain our source data. The upload folder will receive any data that we compute and JobLua is the Lua controller of the job. In our download folder, we will see that we have our source images and our uh, OpenCL script, which will uh, produce the grayscale image and its CUDA variant. Let's start by describing how to create the Lua job. Ok, so here we have the uh, job Lua code. Uh, it doesn't look like much right now. Uh, I will advance through various uh, edits of this file. Currently I have three functions set up and the code begins by executing the job function. The job function for now, the only thing it does, it calls the system API and declares that the job has started. It will do something meanwhile, and at the end it calls the system API and declares that the job ended with success, here defined by true. Uh, the work function will execute the actual work and the setup function we use it to uh, set up uh, if we need any subsystems. So let's forward the edit. Okay, so I added this added this code it requests specifically if we have a, an open cell subsystem available on the machine if we don't it returns false the next edit shows us that on job we call the setup and the work functions if any of those fail we return with an unsuccessful job execution next uh, on work, we download from the container that we set up in the params folder down. Now, if you remember, in Foundry, uh, when we set up the, the, the job, uh, we had the params variable that would be uh, passed to, to this script. 
So that uh, this uh, variable is that variable. So here we have the hash ID of the folder we will be downloading data from. And this function uh, downloads uh, every single file we have on that folder. Now we execute the run OpenCL function. We are going to call the grayscale file with our CL code. And inside of that file, we're going to execute the grayscale, the grayscale function. We will be executing all of these on top of an image and producing an output image. We still need to define this uh, run OpenCL function. So here it is. It receives these uh, variables, which we already have here declared. And now, the first thing we do is create a CL resource, here CL1. Next, we create an image resource, I1, and we import into I1 the image we declared on the function. Next, we create a binary resource or a buffer with the same dimensions of the number of, in, of pixels in the source image. So width times height times four bytes, which correspond to RGBA. Next, we create the i2 uh, of a variable, which will contain the output image. We created from the, the binary we, uh, buffer we already have. So uh, we'll be creating that image with the same width and height of the original and its format will be RGBA. Next, we compile the script we passed into this function and the entry function name. The script will be grayscale.cl and the function name will be grayscale. If the compile fails, we return false. Next, we calculate the number of elements we're going to run over. Uh, this script will run uh, once for each and every pixel in the image. So the number of elements will be its uh, uh, the width times the height of the original image. Finally, all that's left to do is uh, run uh, the OpenCL script. These are the input parameters, the output parameters, and the number of runs we'll be executing. We already calculated elements. Uh, we pass as input parameters the input image, as output parameters the output image, and finally, uh, after these runs, uh, we'll have a grayscale image in the i2 variable, which we then export with the name we passed onto, the, onto this function, which will be out PNG. So now, if everything went correctly, we now have a grayscale image. All that is left to do is to upload that image back into Codex. So we execute the function Codex put file. We receive from parameters the hash ID of the upload folder and we uh, request that the file to be uploaded will be outpng produced by runopencl. This returns a promise uh, and if it fails uh, we'll be returning false from uh, our, our function. Now uh, all that is left to do is to um, configure this script to actually run over the images we uploaded so I replaced here image with a uh, bird and that's it. That's all we need to do. Let's now look at the actual OpenCL script. This is the last edit. I'm going to move to the very first one so we can start from the start. So this is a, an OpenCL kernel. There's not much to see here. We add some uh, details to this function. It's going to receive as input uh, an image RGBA buffer. It's going to produce uh, another uh, buffer as output. And the objective of this is to convert an image into grayscale. Now we declare the both uh, buffers. So this will be our input buffer, input buffer A, and this is going to be our output buffer B. The first thing we do is uh, to get the index of the current element to be processed. This is OpenCL specific. I'm not going to go into 
uh, how you code OpenCL specific code. Uh, you can you can investigate that for yourself later. Now that we have the the current element to be executed, which uh, as we saw we programmed our Lua script to run once once for each pixel, um, we grab the color components of that pixel, so red, green, blue, we access the buffer using this formula and we capture those elements. Next, we calculate the gray component from those red, green and blue components. And all that is left is to write the gray component back into the output buffer B and finally uh, write also the alpha channel. So this is all uh, we require to convert an image from uh, its color components RGBA to uh, grayscale. Uh, we can have a look at the CUDA code, but it's extremely similar. The only thing here that actually uh, is different, we can see some externcy here, global keywords. Uh, we also have to pass the number of elements into the kernel, and we can see that the index uh, is calculated differently but the rest of the code the access to the red green blue components is the same we also compute the gray component the same and we write it back to the output buffer pretty much the same way so once you do an OpenCL script it's very easy to translate it back to CUDA and vice versa so let's see this uh, running now Okay, now we're back in Foundry. We already have uh, our demo job. This is the job file ID, which we uh, got from Codex. Here we have the Codex token, which is valid for the entirety of 2021. And here are the parameters, our folder down and folder up hash IDs. A short description, and our work nodes as have also been associated with this job. So in terms of job description, we have everything we need to actually run this job now. So let's go to events. So let's set the job to ready to run and see what happens on the side of uh, COGS. And that's it. Cox has received the job request and has executed. Let's go back to Codex and see if there's anything inside our upload folder. So let's navigate to our upload folder. And here we have it. Our out PNG exactly as we specified it. Let's see it full scale. And here it is, in grayscale format. We can go to the download folder and see it as it originally is. Okay, now back to Foundry. Let's go back to the Events tab. We can see that the current state has changed to dormant after successful execution. And let's check out the Logs tab. Here it is, the details of uh, the execution of this job. It downloaded all of these files and uploaded the file and finished with success. Now let's see if we can introduce an error into the scripts and see how it comes out. Okay, I'm going to edit the grayscale CL file, the OpenCL version of the grayscale function, and I am going just to add a few dots here. This should produce an error. I'm going to save and I'm going to repeat the execution. In Foundry we set it ready to run again. Here we can see COGS working again. If we now check the logs for the latest run, we can see that there was an error, an OpenCL compile error. Apparently there was something wrong on a specific line. So this helps us debug uh, scripts 
especially when we don't have direct access to the machine's running cogs. Okay, that was a straightforward creation of a simple script. Let's see what happened there. Here we see our three systems. Codex with its files, Foundry with its jobs, and machines running cogs, or nodes. In Foundry, when we trigger our job A, the node associated with that job, node A, gets the associated files. Once we have the job Lua script and the files we need to perform our work, we execute either an OpenCL or a CUDA script on that data, producing our output data. All that is left now is to upload the resulting data back to Codex so that the user can have access to it and send the log back to Foundry so that the job manager can see if anything relevant happened and requires fixes or changes. So it's now obvious that Foundry gives us access to the highly powerful hardware we usually use to run our games. Even a $200 GPU can give us amazing speedups in algorithms to chew large blocks of data. All we did here was to convert an image to grayscale, but the sky is the limit. Let's see other possible jobs. We can add noise to images. We can invert them. We can compute Conway's Game of Life. This was processed using a foundry job that exported multiple frames, and using the FFmpeg utility, those frames were then converted into the GIF we see here. Ray tracing. There are many resources for people that want to code ray tracing scripts because the math and its results are very beautiful. Fluid simulations and neural net code. This part is still under development in COGS, but I'm working on a new neural network class that implements the standard layers, fully connected layers, convolutional neural networks, softmax, relu, etc. It will be perfectly possible to train a neural net to identify digits. I'm also working on an inference interpreter in JavaScript, so you can train the brain and then run it in your browser. So whatever problems you need to tackle, how large or complex, you can do it with Foundry. If there is something that COGS does not do, you can expand it by coding a plugin. If you need to process large blocks of data overnight, or train neural networks to identify data patterns that aren't immediately obvious, if you need the use of multiple nodes to further improve your data throughput, this can all be done through Foundry. Let's now look to the language foundations of this project. The sites were developed using Apache and PHP with MySQL, Bootstrap templates, and of course JavaScript on the front-end, and WorkBots in Node.js on the back-end. On COGS, I used 64-bit C++ and Lua 535 and raw Windows 32 interface calls. As you saw, this resulted in a simple app that sleeps in your system tray but internally, it scans the machine and exposes devices for computation purposes. When COGS migrates to Linux, it will probably be a process with a command line interface, so even less user interface will be present there. Also, you'll be able to find code examples and API details in a Foundry dedicated page. So, both the Codex and Foundry sites use Node.js on the backend and COGS uses the Devil image library to import and export images. Currently, Google's WebP format isn't supported, but it's in the roadmap. Further, COGS exposes devices that can run OpenCL and or CUDA code, and specifically for neural network jobs, we can use NVIDIA's specific neural scripts in CUDA-NYAN and vector matrix tensor accelerators in CUBLAS. Let's look at the roadmap. Okay, first I'll be working to expand COGS default internal neural net code to support OpenCL scripts, CUDA scripts, and CUDNN and Kublas. Aorus will be its own singular project, which I will open source on Git to benefit from code reviews and code submissions from interested individuals. Next, to improve Foundry's ability to create detailed work logs, especially using graphs. To this end, COGS job scripts will need to send back numeric 
timestamp events back to Foundry, which Foundry will be able to graph. You can then make adjustments in your algorithms and see which changes produce the best results. Next, improve the support for multi-node jobs. This means that if you have two nodes working on the same job, to use Foundry API calls to correctly split and balance the workload between those nodes, because nodes can, and quite probably will, differ greatly in their hardware. So it will be in your interest to have benchmarking and then auto-balancing code to split the data between different nodes. Next, a plugin to COGS to enable COGS to download files from a Google Drive. You pass on your Google Drive credentials in your JobLuma script and it will be able to access your Google Drive and download specific files and upload the results. Next, as we already discussed, the Linux version of COGS, which will enable the project to reach even more machines. Next, I haven't talked much about making the Foundry system more real-time. What I mean by this is that, as you saw by the creation of our grayscale job, it has a structure that runs, produces a result, and gives us the result. Now, think in terms of designing a neural network to play chess, for example. Imagine, imagine you code a chessboard and interface in JavaScript for the browser. If each time the user makes a move, we need to fire a job in Foundry to process the board and produce a resulting move, it wouldn't be practical. So to counter this, we can use an in-browser JavaScript API that allows your browser page to talk with a node machine and therefore query and control it, allowing something akin to a real-time experience to happen. Finally, I want to clean up the code in all three of the platforms and have it available in Git for others to use. They can use it to learn CUDA programming or OpenCL programming or develop neural topologies or to learn neural math. The project will benefit from being code reviewed and having submissions from third parties. Nonetheless, it's not a simple project. There are multiple languages, knowledge of web code, knowledge of C++ and Windows code, knowledge of math specific code, etc. So, for now, that is all I think. I'll leave a few links in the video notes below that you can follow up. Please feel free to contact me if you want to learn more about any of the subjects discussed here. I don't know right now what the topic of my next video will be, but I'm planning to create some tutorial videos on neural networks, CUDA and OpenCL coding, and programming Node.js with WebSockets. Foundry is the result of a lot of research that I had to do on topics that really don't have that many fans. But, at the same time, I feel like there are a lot of people out there also trying to create more or less the same things, and they fail because there aren't enough tutorials out there explaining how things work, how to code them, and what is the bath behind them. There are already systems in place that do what Foundry tries to do, and do it better. The objective here was always, on a personal level, academic, and to expose and normalize the use of certain complex systems that don't receive as much attention as other subjects do, and ever to create something that would replace other platforms, like TensorFlow. So, with that end in mind, I hope to be able to share what I've learned in upcoming videos or articles. For now, that is all. Thank you for watching, I'm Ugo Ferreira, I'll see you on my next video. Bye.